Alright, due to how goofy things are going for me, it's going to be a little slower on the production of these videos because I have less time and ability to work on them, and there are many more things that are getting pretty dumb that I also have to talk about. So it will be a little longer between episodes, but you'll also get more detail. Good? Good. Let's begin with the dwarves in Casa Doom, with a panning shot and transition that will make most of the dwindling fans of this series say, oh, This is peak cinema? I'm literally shaking. The transition reveals the seven dwarven rings Calibrimbor made, and I will never not mock these because they all look like gaudy ring pops. Of course, immediately the blueberry flavor messes with Durin III when he joins the dwarves in a new access shaft that, according to Narvi, is destabilizing the mountain. Then why are you digging new ones? I get Dwarves are more stubborn than a Viagra-induced erection, but for the love of Iluvatar, just clear out the ones that are already made! So the king is led to a section of wall by the ring and wants to dig there, but his son Durin IV says that's a foundation wall and we can't dig it. You're inside of a mountain that is almost pure stone, with caverns so massive they can fit Disa with no central pillar, and now architectural fortification matters? Besides, you're trying to reach the outside of the mountain anyway, so it has to be punctured. You can't have it both ways, dimwit. So they refuse to dig, but Durin gives his obvious styrofoam prop to his dad, who then begins digging with awful technique. And oh, well, now dwarves can dig through stone with ease. Who would have thunk? Anyway, and astonishingly one of the smartest moves in the series, Durin the dipshit orders the other miners out of the tunnel in case of a collapse. Five episodes in, and now two good ideas. I'd be proud if I wasn't already more disappointed than their alcoholic fathers. So the king reaches the outside of the mountain, and the dwarves are all like, Hooray! The outside, where we were digging the whole time, and couldn't figure out how to reach. So a montage ensues with one of the dumbest fucking things I've ever heard. Get this, Durin III speaks of surface dwellers as, quote, Slaves to the sun, chained to the rhythmic cycle of stir and slumber. What the fuck am I watching? Your kingdom survives because of the sun, you thimble. The tunnels needed to be dug so the sun could return to the plants so you retards wouldn't starve. Not to mention the sunlight illuminates the hollows of the mountain better than your torches ever could. Who's the floppy dildo that wrote this shit? Probably thought they were cooking like Gordon Ramsay when in reality they are worse than Mr. Krabs on the SS Diarrhea. Anyway, the dwarves are are all happy about the electric bill being paid, but then Disa is unhappy about things. Why? You pushed for this! The whole reason these seven rings were made was because of you, and now you're unhappy? Oh, how could I forget? Your defining character traits are inconsistency and always being correct because you are a black dwarf of color. Back in their home, Dipshit and Lizzo argue about this very thing, and Durin is just as confused as I am when Disa then says she believes the king is cheating using the ring instead of the honed skill of the singing badly into the mountain women. <laughs> what? So, you're just jealous. Sunlight has returned to Casa Doom, the crops will grow, and the people will be saved. And you're unhappy because of jealousy. Bitch, your singing caused further collapsing of the mountain and you acknowledged your inability to help. Fucking hell, these writers are worse than Brian Griffin. Moving on, the couple are in the market, looking for a gift, and they find a tuning crystal for 200 coins. The high expense is due to the new Ring Tribute, put into law by the king. For every one coin spent, one coin goes to the crown. Manway wept, that's a 50% tax, why the hell aren't the dwarves revolting? Every single dwarf should be flying Gadsden flags like it was a Second Amendment parade, why hasn't the dictator-in-chief been dethroned? Worse yet, why are you all complacent? Oh yeah, don't think, just consume. So, Disa convinces Doran to pay up 150 instead, because we all know world-famous dwarven stubbornness is meaningless in the eyes of terrible writers. He walks off, and she picks up the crystal, then bumps into something someone, because apparently no one notices this hippo. She drops the crystal, which doesn't shatter, put a pin in that, and it rolls away, and we get a scene of her bumping into everyone that's so funny I forgot to laugh. Probably because the Big Bang Theory laugh tracks weren't added. It's rolling! Oh, you seem to have kicked it! I'm so sorry. 
So this stupid ball rolls into a conspicuous alcove, and Disa sings a bit to inspect the area, because she's apparently never been here. How do you not know this place exists when you've been singing in Casa Doom your whole life? Whatever, she finds the crystal, and as she sings, a counter-roar carries through the bowels of the mountain, causing her to drop and shatter the crystal. Of course it breaks now, these retards can't even apply consistent characteristics to a fucking rock. Meanwhile, the king holds a meeting with six emissaries, one of which hasn't even been unlocked yet. Afterwards, in his chambers, Durin III removes the restrictions he put on mining years ago, and then gets angry at Narvi because he removed his own ring. This is probably one of the better scenes in the season because of the effect the ring is having, but too bad it's undermined by the fact the rings shouldn't have this effect yet. Anyway, Narvi is given the new orders to continue digging deeper when Durin III bursts in through the door telling Narvi not to do what he's doing. How would you know what he's doing? Whatever, Narvi listens to the king despite Dimwit's warning. Then the king makes the bold assertion that with the ring he can see the mountain like a Minecraft glitch. Seriously, listen for yourself. I can see it. Every shaft, every ore, every jewel. By Eru, I hate how this season is plagued by inconsistent writing. Even more so than the last. Here's a couple problems. First, if he can see every shaft, giggity, then he knows that the Belrog is down there, so his claim that Disa is wrong can't be true. And if you want to counter with, well, Sauron knows it's down there, which is confirmed by episode 6, well, that can't be true, because... Sauron doesn't know where any of the Balrogs are supposed to be. Even if we assume he's supposed to in this series, he was role-playing Ivan Ooze for a thousand years. So when the Balrog fled after Morgoth's defeat, he shouldn't know its whereabouts unless he attached a GPS to its ankle monitor. We then get a brief interlude in Eregion, where Durin III fast-traveled all the way to ask Celebrimbor about tech support. He opens a ticket about how his dad isn't the same anymore, and Celebrimbor reassures him there cannot be any faults with the ring. To which Durin's last brain cell fires off, asking him about how much he knows about the Kendal up in his tower. Another fast travel back to Casa Doom, and Dimwit confronts his dad, begging his father to no longer use the ring. The king then says he's proud of his son for getting the rings and wants him to be by his side, and then. Back at home, Dipshit arrives wearing the collar his dad offered him. Because, again, stubbornness is a 12-letter word the writers cannot define. And Mrs. I'm Right All the Time makes him swear he'll never use any of the rings. Now, let's jump over to Eregion, where Celebrimbor celebrates the union of dwarves and elves, and presents Narvi with the doors of Dur- What the fuck? Why can we see the doors? They're supposed to be hidden unless moonlight strikes the Ithidin lining! What's the point of a secret door if everyone can see it? Might as well Velcro Kronk to the front of them. Anyway, the celebration goes well, and Sauron walks away to coax Celebrimbor into speaking with him. He wants to hurry along and get the Nine Rings of Men made all ready to fulfill his next part of the plan. Celebrimbor then makes a comment about how you always lay seeds in other people's minds, don't you? Haha, <laughs> get it everyone? J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay's favorite movie is Inception. Anyway, the Kendall wants the rings made, but Celebrimbor refuses because men are easily corrupted, exemplifying those of the Southlands who aided Adar. Anastasia then counters with, he's been to Numenor and fears it. Not helping your case, but sure. He continues with, men are capable of great evils, as well well as good deeds, then name drops a bunch of references for the audience so the trained seals can clap and say, Oh my god, he said Baron, I am literally shaking right now. He wants the nine rings, and again, Celebrimbor says no. Of course, Sauron takes no for an answer about as well as P. Diddy, so he sets about making the rings himself. Later that night, question mark, some noises gain Celebrimbor's attention. When everyone gathers around, they notice objects start moving on their own and Sauron mentions the blonde elf was trying to resize them when more tools just start floating. What happens next tells us this episode's director is a fan of Tom and Jerry. For absolutely no reason at all, the forge erupts, causing the elf who was directed to not pay attention to stumble backwards, kicking the rope tie, which drops the giant fucking anvil to drop from the ceiling, nearly crushing one of the extras. The anvil doesn't go through the floor, and a hammer comes flying towards Celebrim, or hopefully to knock some sense into him. He catches it, then finds Blondie's hand, and takes the ring off with a weird ting sound effect. <laughs> This won't be the only noticeable sound issue in this episode, by the way. Also, 
how did you know how and where her hand was and which finger it was on? Anyway, she reappears frantic, talking mad, mad, I tell you, about a realm of mist and seeing a figure wreathed in flame because she can't stop referencing other films. All right, just a few little questions about this masterpiece of cinema. First off, why didn't you just take the ring off? Why didn't you call for help? Why is it you did not try to strike the figure in flame instead of cuck up Rimbor? Why didn't you explain that Anatar is the source of the fire? Were you the one who ignited the forge, or did the shape make a motion right before the forge erupted? I absolutely hate these questions and more exist because they should have been accounted for. The lengths the writers go to twist this plot into a pretzel in order to prevent everyone from figuring out who Anatar really is never ceases to amaze me. Excluding the events, but not the quality of the novels, this scene would have resulted in Anatar's immediate reveal. I mean, seriously, A World of Mists is obviously referencing Frodo's perspective in the Jackson trilogy, so the fact she doesn't define anything is asinine. And fuck any arguments that would disagree with this, because first, while invisible, she should still see everyone clear enough to discern who they are. Celebrimbor standing in front of Sauron shouldn't be mistaken identity for this reason either. Second, I don't need to know how the ring works in this context, because we know what scenes are referenced specifically. The only reason the Anatar persona fools anyone is because the mounting evidence is ignored because the writers say so. Also, would this extra get off the fucking ground already? Please, you're embarrassing yourself. Anyway, like everyone else, Blondie can't stop playing the pronoun game and not describe anything in detail. Calabimbo then asks what happened, and she explains they used more mithril in the mix. Just before Celebrimbor is then about to scold Anatar, Durin the Dimwit has arrived, as I detailed before. Skipping ahead and then back into the tower, and we find Anatar is comforting Murdania. Anatar then states that what she saw was the world of mists, and claims that what she saw was also basically Celebrimbor's aura, because he's more susceptible to corruption. Again, all of this is retarded, because she, like any other character, is basically told to ignore everything in front of them. He then asks her not to repeat what she said about Celebrimbor to anyone, and immediately switches gears to complimenting her hair because she looks like his lady Galadriel, which is a pretty underhanded burn, but she takes it as a compliment. God, you look so pretty. You look like that girl that I really like, but you're not her. Later, the Kendal and Cuckabrimbor have a fight, and he finally grows a pair asking Anatar if he altered the rings. First off, he takes like five seconds to respond to this, which should be a crimson red flag, my guy, but sure, just believe he didn't. And Let's also ignore the fact that this guy revealed himself to be a Maya and held on to the mithril suspiciously long before dropping it into the mixture in front of you. But besides that, yeah, yeah, yeah nothing went wrong, sure. Then the gaslighter in chief says, we are to blame. He claims this process of forging rings is as much of spirit as it is of craft, implying Celebrimbor's message to Gilgalad was deceitful in nature, so therefore, Celebrimbor tainted the rings. Now, this could almost be believable given the setting of this series if it wasn't for the fact he immediately basically adds, in for a penny, in for a pound, let's make more rings. How Celebrimbor wasn't immediately tipped off by this request either, I will never understand. If the seven were made in the air of deceit, then any more afterwards would be as well. Again, the writers didn't think anything through, and we're left to sit here and watch this mountain of shit pile up as they expect us to accept this and claim that this is high art. He then gathers all the smiths and blames everyone for the failure of the Seven. Jesus, dude, this is the fastest character turnaround I think I've ever seen. You just learned you and Anatar were the reason the rings were faulty. Oh, but now the whole team is to blame? Gotta keep that artificial drama going and increase tensions because how else is Murdania going to believe Celebrimbor is losing his mind? Anyway, he also threatens that any less than 100% means you are no longer a smith in a region. How? How would that help? If any of these workers walked away and mentioned how up your own ass you were, then people would start to question you and your abilities after the believed failure of the Seven. The show can't even convey how prideful this version of Celebrimbor is supposed to be without his character changing between scenes faster than a magician's performance. Then Anatar tries to rally the troops and hype everyone up to get the rings made. And now we travel west to Numenor and catch up with our Farazan looking out over the kingdom he just usurped, because apparently both both Muriel and her supporters are blind and deaf. Karl Marx then tells his son Kemen that his mom once thought that he would meet a terrible fate 
wink wink, and not to disappoint him with his next task. This dude's just Hercule at this point, keeping all the gas lit. That night, Elendil and Muriel discuss how bad things are going, as she's tanking in the polls after Mark stole the silicone of Numenor. Queen Latifah then asks what Father of the Year saw in the Palantir when he touched it, and of course, no one can give a straight fucking answer as we keep playing the pronoun game. Elendil says, I was lost. I... <laughs> Just say you're riding on a horse away from the city. Hold on, I almost forgot. Let me double check something. Ah, oh, that's right. These retards treat J.J. Abrams like their Jedi Master. Anyway, Queen of the Magic Conch Shell reveals her favorite show is SpongeBob SquarePants because her brilliant idea is to do nothing. Fantastic plan. Let the fascist win in order to save Numenor. I'm sorry, I thought I had the concussion. Were you hind kicked by a horse? Anyway, they touch each other because the writers want to force these two together like so many others. The next day, in true communist fashion, everyone who disagrees with the government is to be both deranked and disarmed. And right after my placement match, too. Discount Aragorn finds this out and that his daughter is working with Kemen. The two have a spat because she thinks she's the only one suffering, apparently. You know, because the CWD DNA is strong with these characters. She says, you're walking a treacherous path, and then her dad responds with, and yours is made of seawater. Take care to keep your feet beneath you. It's a long way to the bottom. I, I, I don't know why I keep forgetting this is the same series that asked why rocks sink and boats float. Anyway, Elendil hands over his sword and then leaves. Later, Elendil joins Valendil and other faithful in a shrine to commemorate the loss of those who fell in Middle-earth. And the son he left behind, let's not forget that one. I'm not gonna stop harping on this one. We all watched a fucking clownfish outfather Elendil the Tall. My Eru. Anyway, Kemen then shows up having just condemned the shrine of the Valar and anyone who does not leave will be arrested. Valendil is understandably pissed about this and decides to do the Lord's work and lays the smack down on this communist. You are now the best character in the series. They fight it out while some guards do a stupid little jig in the background and Elendil tells Moptop to stop, but not before he breaks Kemen's arm. Then, after putting the sword to his throat, Blackendil pulls the sword away from Kemen with this sound effect. <laughs> Yep, sound mixing is impossible for these retards to get correct. Here it is again! I never would have guessed metal and cloth could make such a sharp sound. This is almost as bad as the voice actor for Starmie in the French dub of Pokemon. Go! <sighs> yep, that's real. Anyway, Valendil then drops the sword and stands up in a wide shot with his back against a communist. So, of course, he gets what they do best. You know, maybe he would have survived if there was a sound effect when Kemen picked the sword up off the ground. Or, you know, Elendil the Tall not being Elendil the Blind and telling him to look out because he has a clear line of fucking sight on the both of them. But, whatever, we're not allowed to have nice things, I guess. R.I.P. the best character in this series. Kemen then orders the guards to arrest Elendil and report that he is the one who started the revolt. Now, let's jump over to presumably Linden, where Elrond and the rest of the discount ship run as fast as they can to warn Gilgalad about what's going on. And to lighten his load, he drops his cloak. This is why I continue to mock them traveling by foot with such an urgent mission. Why didn't they just take the damn horses? Or, you know, speed past Tyr Gorthad instead of wasting time standing there like a bunch of idiots as one of their members is killed. Anyway, in Linden Actual, High King Gilgalad opens his Gmail and finds a message from Eregion has arrived, the one sent by Celebrimbor. Hold the fuck on, the messenger from Eregion took a different and faster path than Elrond's crew? Let me guess, it was one of the roads that went north around the Fallen Bridge? Let me break this down for a second. Let's assume Gilgalad's halls are about here. Eregion, which I actually mixed up, is supposed to be here. Not here. That's my mistake. I tend to mix up the river deltas because of Bilbo's adventure. Anyway, it doesn't change much, and Eregion is actually about here. So Sauron destroyed the bridge somewhere around here, just north of the Shire, aka the Suzat's Haderach. Elrond's crew then traveled east. They headed out towards the Shire, headed south because the bridge was out, that put them past Tyr Gorthad, and then they continued towards Eregion. Somewhere in the middle of all of this bullshit, Galadriel is captured by the orcs, which couldn't have been too far from Eregion, before Elrond thought it was wise to run all the fucking way back to Linden instead of splitting the group, some heading towards Eregion to complete the quest, and the rest returning to inform High King Diabetes. And somehow, in the middle of all of this, they missed Eregion's messenger. How the 
fuck did you pull that one off? And how did you get to Linden faster than Elrond's team? D did you did you have a horse? I bet he used a horse. It still doesn't answer how you missed Elrond's gigantic forehead on the return. I'm sure that would have sped up the journey a bit, but I forget this entire paragraph had more thought put into it than the entire writing staff of this team put into their lunch break. Whatever, someone off screen picked them up and dropped them off, and one segue later, Elrond arrives in Linden to tell High King Cholesterol that Galadriel was right because of course she always fucking is. He then pleads to send an army to Eregion. Then High King Big Mac responds with, We cannot defeat the orc army alone. How would you know? Elrond didn't see the rest of the army. He watched Galadriel charge into 40 or 50 tops to increase her creep score. When and how did you identify thousands of orcs? You and the rest of the crew shimmied like Mick Jagger in the opposite direction. And no, I won't accept that elves can see past the horizon when elves in this series can't see the orcs digging trenches in the Southlands from this fucking tower. So anyway, he says that we cannot fight them alone, which means they're prepping for the big battle that's going to happen later. And put a pin in that one because that one gets really stupid. Anyway, we lastly catch up with the orcs in the wilds just outside of Eregion. Uh, uh, wait, wait the fuck a second. Where did this wall come from? Is the concussion getting to me? I don't remember that being there. Hold on, let me check something. Yep, season one, episode two. No wall in sight. Did you guys convince Mexico to pay for it? If you did, that's pretty based. Otherwise, it's absolutely astounding that these writers are so horrendous at what they do that they retconned their own canon yet again and added a wall for the siege of Eregion. Now I see why Elrond claimed that the four dozen extras he saw was actually a legion of orcs, because of course the second unit director's favorite battle is the Battle of Helm's Deep. Damn it. Anyway, Galadriel's been captured by Adar and his forces and brought to their encampment, which is yet another series of trenches they've dug out because every elf in this series has worse eyesight than I do. Then the orc, who only wants to stay at home and raise a family and isn't murderous or threatening in any real way, releases Galadriel from the cage and immediately puts a knife to her throat because he's so peaceful. Adar then stops this orc from brightening my day and she pulls her hairpin, which happens to be a knife because of fucking course it is. Adar then mentions he brought her here to talk in hopes of a temporary alliance to defeat Sauron. And thus concludes episode 5. I don't really have anything else to add with this one. These episodes managed to continuously worsen, and I've said quite a bit about it, and I don't think that I need to repeat myself too much. So I'm going to cut this video a little short here and get back to writing the next episode, as well as Joker 2. So stay tuned. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.